Continuing in our study of Acts, uh, while we'll focus on chapter 23, we're going to spend a little time on, in chapter 22 as well, but uh, we're going to follow a particular theme. But first, let us take a moment to come before the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Father, it is not an ordinary thing for us to hear from you. And yet, your word is always available to us. But it is always significant when your spirit accompanies the reading and preaching of your word. It is a special moment. It is a special time when you work in our lives and in our hearts and you renew our minds. So Lord, will you do that in this next few minutes? Will you so work in our hearts and convict our conscience Stir us to, to change and to repent and to turn to your Son, our only hope and refuge. In his name we pray. Amen. So there is a prevailing thought or an idea among professing Christians which is confounding to me. It's this notion that says... Since I am a follower of Jesus, I can expect to have a prosperous life. The notion says, as a faithful Christian, I can expect to be comfortable. And I can expect to live at ease. Indeed, there are some who, upon hearing that Jesus promises abundant life come to him with the expectation of receiving a myriad of external blessings and outward advantages. But as you read on in the New Testament, you can't help but wonder if Jesus' understanding of abundant life is dramatically different than our own understanding of abundant life. You see, we often equate abundance with what? We equate abundance with the accumulation of things. Abundance is when we accumulate wealth, we accumulate property, we accumulate accolades and so forth. But what if, what if the abundance that a Christian is to experience. What if this abundance is spiritual in nature? I'm thinking of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, where Paul says, God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now, I'm not suggesting that a Christian never receives external blessings and never receives outward advantages. I'm not saying this is never the case. My observation, reading Scripture, is simply that God has a different view of abundant life than you and I typically do. And so we must not lock ourselves into the mindset that says, if I am faithful to God, everything will go smoothly for me. Everything will be amazing in my life. C.S. Lewis sought to dispel this myth when he famously wrote, I didn't go to religion to make me happy. I always knew a bottle of port would do that. If you want a religion to make you feel really comfortable, I certainly don't recommend Christianity. See, Lewis challenges us here to think about why we've come to Christ in the first place. Did you come to Christ primarily for outward advantages? Or did you come to him for spiritual blessings or for something else? 
I've heard many people express a belief and a correlation that there is a correlation between a Christian's faithfulness and the degree to which they outwardly prosper. They almost think that it's some spiritual formula, that the more we love Jesus, the better we follow Jesus, the easier and more comfortable and more prosperous our life gets. I find that view to be confounding, because as I read the New Testament, I find that view to be demonstratively false. Paul explicitly counters this in his second letter to Timothy when he says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Hearing this, we might even say that there is a correlation between a Christian's faithfulness and the degree to which they suffer. It's as if Scripture is saying the closer we get to Jesus, the more uncomfortable our earthly life will get. I want to draw this out looking at the passage before you, but before I do that, there's a very interesting story about the Methodist preacher John Wesley and how he correlated his faithfulness to hardship. John Wesley was riding along on his horse one day, and he realized that it had been three whole days since he had experienced any kind of hardship or trouble or persecution. Not a single egg had been thrown his way while he preached. The hateful shouts from the crowd had been non-existent for three days. And so John Wesley stopped his horse... And he said out loud to himself and to the Lord, could it be that I have backslidden or that I have sinned and that is why life has gone so easily? And so he slipped off his horse and Wesley took a knee and he prayed. And during this time, a man who didn't like John Wesley walked by. And as the man saw John Wesley on his knee praying, the man picked up a brick and threw it at Wesley. Just missed him. But Wesley was stirred from his prayer as the brick came flying by. And he said, Thank you, Lord. <laughs> For Wesley... The greater his faithfulness, the greater the difficulties. Now, you might say that that correlation is too rigid. But again, as we look at the New Testament, some correlation exists between our faithfulness and the suffering that we experience. This is consistent within the New Testament. We've given you 2 Timothy 3. Let's think this through with a few other examples. Consider Jesus, perfectly faithful to the Father, entirely obedient to the law, and yet he's arrested. He's beaten, whipped, and crucified between two criminals. Consider Stephen, the one who was recently commissioned as a deacon, known to be full of the Holy Spirit, he's stoned to death in Acts chapter 7. Consider the apostle James, the son of Zebedee, who is killed by the sword. That's a polite way of saying he had his head cut off in Acts chapter 12. And here in these latter chapters and Acts, we see the Apostle Paul regularly attacked, often beaten, often arrested in response to his proclamation of Jesus as the Christ. You remember in Acts 21, Paul is dragged out of the temple, physically dragged. He's beaten and he's put in chains. 
Then we go to Acts 22, and, and Paul manages to convince the Roman tribune to allow him to speak uh, to the mob of Jews that want to harm Paul. So Paul, speaking to these gathered Jews, uh, he speaks to them about his encounter with the resurrected Jesus on the road to Damascus. He shares with his fellow countrymen how he is an apostle, been made an apostle to the Gentiles. But this doesn't go over very well. In response to Paul's testimony, we see in chapter 22, verse 22, the Jews demand that Paul be killed. And as the Roman soldiers prepare to interrogate Paul by flogging, Paul divulges that he's a Roman citizen. And this, this stops any beating that he would get from the Roman soldiers. The Roman tribune, however, still wants to assess whether the Apostle Paul is a threat. And so since they can't beat the truth out of him themselves, they bring him before a Jewish tribune, the Sanhedrin, so that Paul can have a trial by his peers. Listen to how Paul begins his address to his fellow countrymen. Verse 1. Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. Sounds like a very reasonable statement, a very positive, fair opening word from Paul. And yet, what do we read in verse 2? The high priest, Ananias, commanded those who stood by Paul to strike him on the mouth. And then we follow the text along, and we see that Paul responds to being struck in the mouth by speaking harshly to the high priest, although Paul doesn't realize it's the high priest, and so he takes back what he says. And then a bit later on, when Paul discerns that the interrogation is comprised of two groups, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, then Paul changes his strategy. Paul identifies himself as a Pharisee, which he was. And Paul affirms the resurrection of the dead, which is something that the Sadducees deny. And so a division, a violent division, arises between the Pharisees and the Sadducees about what to do with Paul. It escalates to violence, and again a near riot ensues. We're told that Paul is returned to the barracks, and the conflict is temporarily set aside. But what follows is, is my favorite part of this account. But I need to keep, and we need to keep in mind, everything that's led up to this verse that I'm going to talk about in a minute. I want us to think through. We, we've been studying Acts seemingly for many months now. And everything has been leading to Paul's journey to Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit testifies what awaits Paul in Jerusalem. He's pushing to Jerusalem. He finally gets to Jerusalem. And what happens? He's met by an angry mob. He's physically dragged out of the temple. And when he's finally given an opportunity to speak to his countrymen, they want to kill him. And another riot flares up. Then the Roman tribune is ready to beat the truth out of Paul until he holds them off with the declaration that he's a Roman citizen. Now finally before the Sanhedrin, a council of his peers elite Jewish leaders, another riot almost breaks out. So Paul's put back in barracks. He's put back in confinement. And I imagine this to be one of the darkest nights in Paul's life. Paul had a passion for his own people. He had a hope of effective testimony to his fellow Jews but that hope was all but extinguished. In addition to the, his physical exhaustion, I can imagine you'd be quite worn out if somebody physically drags you out of a temple. In addition to the physical and emotional exhaustion, I imagine that Paul is feeling dejected, depressed, lonely, 
Paul may have felt alone, but it is clear that he was never alone. Look at verse 11. The following night, the Lord stood by him. What an encouragement to hear that. He felt alone, but he was not alone because the Lord stood by him. Now, the phrasing of this is conspicuously familiar. If your Bibles are open, you'll see this immediately. The phrasing resembles what we read in verse 2, because there's someone else who's standing by Paul. In verse 2, we read the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. So it's not enough to have just anyone stand by you because someone might be standing by you who strikes you on the mouth. And that's the powerful contrast here, that there are those who are standing near to us in life, but they stand near to harm us. There are those we may have close proximity to in our home or in our workplace or some other context, but they're close to us in order to hurt us. But the Lord stands by you to help you. And ultimately, that's what matters most. Now I realize adversity comes in many different shapes and sizes. Adversity may come in your life as it did with Paul, in the form of persecution as you seek to proclaim Christ and share him with others, you may be persecuted. Adversity may also come from within the church as the enemy seeks to sow division from within and among God's people. Adversity may come to you in the way that it came to Job in the form of illness, the death of loved ones, and loss of financial wealth. I think we all know intuitively, intuitively that there is no escaping suffering, not for anyone in this room. Indeed, there is no promise in Scripture to suggest that the people of God are exempt from suffering, or even that we will suffer less than others. But we have this assurance. When the people of God suffer, He promises to stand by us. One of the most beloved verses in all of Scripture frames this principle beautifully. And of course, it's at this beautiful verse that the sirens sound. Psalm 23. Working hard today. Psalm 23, verse 4. What does it say? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Friends, whatever you're going through, whatever weight you are bearing, whatever hardship you are navigating, be encouraged. God stands by his people. A mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark never failing. He promises to stand by his people, and he promises to stand by you. Now, as encouraged as I am by this promise... I'm intrigued by the Lord's message to Paul. Did you notice that in verse 11? What the Lord says to Paul when he's standing by him? He says to Paul, take courage. 
In other words, fear not. For as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, you must also testify also in Rome. You see how striking that message is? Because I'm struck by what the Lord doesn't say. He doesn't say, take courage, Paul. For even though you've been beaten for your testimony in Jerusalem, don't worry, everything's going to get better from here on out. The worst is behind you. Things will improve. The Lord does not say, He does not say, take courage, Paul. I will make a way when there is no way. Now, can the Lord make a way when there is no way? Of course he can. But that's not the promise. That's not what the Lord says. God doesn't promise a way out, nor does he promise that things will get easier. To the contrary, the Lord's message is essentially this. Paul, you know how you've experienced all this hardship in Jerusalem because of your testimony? Well, the same thing's going to happen in Rome. You're, you're going to be faithful and proclaim Jesus, my son, in Rome, and, and bad things are going to happen. So how, how does that give Paul courage? How can that scenario embolden Paul? How can that scenario remove his fear? By extension, how can we be without fear when we face life's worst moments? How can we be free of anxiety when the weight is too heavy? We do so by remembering that the Lord is with us. He stands by us. And so we're able to bear up and stand firm in the harshest of storms. But what is our instinct? What, is, what does our nature do when suffering comes? Well, our instinct, I think, at least my instinct, is to look for the escape hatch. How do I get out of this? This is very uncomfortable. How do I escape from this? Our natural instinct is to pray to the Lord and to ask him to blow open the exit door so that we can get out of the suffering. But that's not what God has promised us. God promises, well, Paul promises the Corinthians that there's a way of escape. Do you remember that passage from chapter 10? But the way of escape that Paul promises is in the context of what? Temptation. God promises a way out, a way of escape, as it relates to temptation, but suffering is another matter. And so in 2 Corinthians, Paul explains how he had prayed three times for this pesky thorn to be removed from his flesh. And the Lord didn't remove it. In fact, the Lord refused to remove the thorn from Paul's flesh. Instead of helping him escape, instead of putting his suffering to an end, what does the Lord do? He says, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is manifest in weakness. To say that God's grace is sufficient is to affirm that it's all we need that it's enough. It's to say that the presence of the Lord is enough. We find it to be true for Paul in Acts 23, and we find it be, to be true throughout the New Testament. So I want you to know for certain this morning, abundant life is not to be found in the absence of trouble, but through the sustaining presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is enough that Jesus stands by his people when they are hurting. Fear and anxious thoughts scatter when we remember and when we confess 
Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. That's abundant life. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Spiritual blessings. The presence of the Lord was enough for King David. The presence of the Lord was enough for the Apostle Paul. And the presence of the Lord is enough for you. And it's enough for me. Lean into his presence. Bask in his presence. Even while the storms rage around you, bask in his presence. Because enduring satisfaction and abundant life is found in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.